Our next panel now is looking at the extent to which human rights can be a unifying theme across different sections of the Australian community. And with that in mind, and knowing that sport is a national obsession, it's fitting that our moderator is former Socceroo and human rights activist Craig Foster. And our panellists that will be joining him for this discussion are non-executive director and sustainability advisor and drum panellist, drum panellist Sam Moston. Yes. <laughs> Former independent MP, women's right advocate and community worker, Cathy McGowan, AO, welcome to you. ABC producer and access and inclusion coordinator at the Arena Theatre, Eliza Hull. So, <laughs> over to you, Craig. All Thanks. right, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's been a fascinating time already. Thank you for your time this morning, uh, ladies. Lovely to have you here. We are talking about whether human rights can be a common ground between all people in Australia. So we might just begin, shall we, by starting here and each of you have an opportunity for a positive message before we talk about some of the more challenging ones of some of the improvements uh, and some of the steps forward perhaps that you've seen in human rights in recent years in your field. Sam? Um, can I start? Oh. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and really pay respect to that panel this morning mm. that mm. took us into a conversation that um, I think the Human Rights Commission should be congratulated mm. for sharing with us. It was Wonderful. a very meaningful conversation. Um, I also want to acknowledge you, oh. um, because I think one of the greatest steps in human rights we've seen in recent times is Craig Foster and the hashtag Save Hakeem. Yes. And I think we should congratulate oh. Craig. Oh, thank you. There was a lot of wonderful people involved in that, Sam, as you know, and many are in this room, so congratulations uh, to them. Well, it was where I wanted to start on talking about where I think, um, to pick up Michelle Bachelet's great comment about strategic optimism, mm. is I thought that your campaign taught us all about how human rights can be a fundamental set of conversations with the ordinary people of the country if you tap into the things that they care about. And as Julia, you said, people care about sport in this country, and all of a sudden, Craig, you were um, promoting a notion of rights for a, a man who otherwise would not have been supported and you were able to generate a sports phenomenal uh, support for human rights and you were then using the language interchangeably, human rights and the rights of this man and, and his incarceration and what you were doing by mobilising millions around the world in a way that I just think we don't often do in human rights. Mm. So I want to start in a place where um, when I was... Um, a, a lawyer, I was trained as a lawyer and then worked for Michael Kirby in my first job. So my first exposure to human rights, having read Michael Kirby's judgments, which made human rights normal and human, I got to work for him and see how much time and effort that took to translate deep human rights norms into the, co the common language of what affects all of us in our communities. That's what you did and I think that's what we're beginning to see change in business and sport and, and many parts of our community who have often felt quite isolated from the language of human rights norms. I think you've heard that this morning from a number of the panellists and, and commentators and, and from Michelle Bachelet. This language, if the, if the idea that the law of human rights keeps us at bay and is somehow applied to, upon us, I think we end up in a place where we don't understand what those rights are doing for us as normal human beings. So what I've seen since the 1990s and through the early 2000s, where if I'd mentioned human rights in a boardroom or in an executive team, it was like kryptonite for getting anything mm. done. Because if I said human rights, I think I was regarded as a, um, a spy, um, someone infiltrating mm. the system, the, the capitalist system. Um, but we were having conversations about, in, in big companies then, about um, what was corporate social responsibility really designed to do. Um, but every time the term human rights was entered into, that led to this terribly toxic and very binary debate about um, rights versus shareholders, you know, the supremacy of shareholder rights. Mm. Flip forward to today, and we have um, many people around the country complaining that companies are no longer st sticking to their knitting, <laughs> something I find really, really peculiar, because actually these conversations that are taking place in the boardrooms I'm privileged to sit in and working with executives around the country, these are human rights in action that are core to the business. 
So the kind of rights we talk about around the board tables I sit in is the right to safety, the right to a safe workplace, the right to a, a mentally safe place, a psychologically safe place, um, diversity, inclusion, and, um, and a sense of belonging at work. This is the normal language of good companies, that to belong in a, in a place now, you've got to be fully deployed as a human being and your rights are observed. The number of organisations in this country that now have a wrap or have a significant commitment to the Uluru Statement. Companies like KPMG just yesterday coming out and actively supporting an increase in new start, talking about the break in the social contract seen by an accounting firm concerned about the future economy. That they're human rights that mm. they're talking about. Um, the right to work, so modern slavery, that's a conversation that's in every boardroom around the country today. It's been legislated, but it's seen as an advantage for those companies to understand supply chains and thinking about workers' rights through those supply chains. And of course, domestic violence. There isn't a company I'm involved with who doesn't have a domestic violence leave policy, who hasn't started to have a conversation in their organisations that speak to both perpetrators and, and victims and survivors and actually open up the space for a conversation about the rights of women to a safe environment. Um, and post Royal Commissions, which mm. have been the big wake up call about rights, I think, and about the tramping on rights by some companies, you see us all as a community redoubling our efforts to think about what does it mean to be a vulnerable customer? What does it mean to be a vulnerable aged care, um, a person in aged care um, who wants a decent um, period of time of care in their life? That's what gives me hope, Craig, because mm. they're the conversations that are just normal, and I think we've got a complete disconnect between our political class and and I think progressive business um, that wants to still build shareholder value and still create great value. Um, I don't know what the political class think we're doing in business. We're actually creating jobs. We're creating um, opportunities. Um, we're interested in employing migrants and refugees. We want to do the right thing by the country, and that gets turned into somehow not sticking to our mission. So I'm really, really uh, fired up and very positive about the fact that good companies, good business leaders um, have actually embraced human rights. They may still not use the language, they, I think they still find it troubling to hear about the human rights norm, but in fact, it imbues most of the things that I'm seeing that, are, that tell you about what's going well in this country. Mm. Wonderful. So the concept before CAPI um, that uh, the High Commission was talking about was this concept of politicisation of human rights and so on, based on what Sam has talked about. What's your perspective on human rights, politics and the broader community? Mm -hmm. So, hello everybody and thanks for turning up in such large numbers. Um, my contribution to this discussion today is around the unity of this idea of a fair go, mm. which I think I would like to say is one of those Australian values, and picking up the theme that we've heard already this morning about voice and the link between voice and a fair go and the political consequence of that. <coughs> so, the story in our part of northeast Victoria was we were a community that didn't think we had a fair go, we didn't think our representation was working for us, and we felt really significantly disenfranchised. So how did we find voice? And we set up an organisation called Voice for Indi, which I just love the concept of it. But it wasn't just about finding voice, it was also about listening. So we set up a process called Kitchen Table Conversations around the electorate. So people, um, and I think it was built on the, the, the experience that I'd had and others of my colleagues back in the, the 1970s of raising the consciousness of part of the women's movement, of being able to talk and hear and discuss. So the kitchen table conversations gave voice, but also gave listening. And a, a bit like what we heard from our Aboriginal um, brothers and sisters this morning, it wasn't just about that first stage, though we did do that, the next stage of it was organisational change that went with it. And one of the fantastic things about our democracy is you can, at the grassroots, if you get organised, change. Mm. So in our electorate of Indi, we had the voice, we had the discussion, and then we got the shared vision, which I think you can't underestimate enough. And our shared vision was what would our community look like if we had an independent member of parliament and we had some competition in the system, like, um, a competitive electorate. So that was our vision. We didn't at the time think we were going to win, but we had the vision. And then we got organised. So we had the conversation, we had the listening, we had the vision, and then we seriously got organised about our campaign. And I just can't say enough that you can do it. 
and that we did it. We were a conservative, isolated, no internet, no, no mobile phone coverage, disadvantaged community, and we overturned the political power structure from the grassroots up. And I was the end result of that. And I have to say, we did it in 2013. And it wasn't enough just to do it once. We had to show, as Pat Dodson, um, Mick Dodson, sorry, said this morning, that we could self-govern, we could self-organise. And we won a second time. And that was the really important, the second win. But then in 2019, we did the succession planning to show that this just wasn't a personality thing, that this was something that our community actually wanted. So 32,000 people in rural Victoria, out of 100,000 people, gave Helen Haynes, Dr Helen Haynes, their first preference. So that is such a strong message. And I just can't underestimate the change that's caused in our community. And it wasn't just about the political bit, it's that people now know they've got the taste of winning. <laughs> and it's everybody's got the taste of winning. The young kids have got it, the Aboriginal people have got it, um, our refugee groups have got it, our whatever. And they're organising because they've learnt the skills of it. So in terms of the politicalisation of it, we haven't quite got the change I think we need at the Commonwealth level, but that's going to happen. Because everywhere I go around rural and regional Australia, everywhere I go, people say, oh my God, we want some of that. We want competition in the system. And we don't like it that the same people who give money, enormous amounts of money to the political parties, give it to the both political parties. <laughs> so there's no competition. They bo both, both sides get the funding from the same you know, corporate sponsors. Whereas running as an independent, you know you're actually going to get some independence. So in answer to the politicalisation of it, and again reflecting um, what Mick Dobson and the others said this morning, you've got to gird your line lo lo loins for a bit of a trip here. It's not going to happen in a hurry. But there's going to be such partnership when we get it because the community want a fair go. It's in their DNA. And they know they haven't got it with the current system on all sorts of levels. And I tell you, I've been all around Australia in the last three, two months and everywhere I've gone, I've heard the level of dissatisfaction. And let me put a, a huge call out to both the political part, major political parties. You've miss, you're missing the boat. There is such a wave of uh, discontent with the values that are underpinning what's going on in this country. And the fundamental value is people are not getting a fair go. So the politicisation is happening and conferences like today are hugely important to providing a vision for it. But I, I have to say, let's not fall into the trap of top down, to bring the community with us. And I, I just want to be part of the discussion around um, voice and treaty and uh, voice treaty and truth telling. Because I think in that process, if we can run it out around the country, we could be really working on, on substantive community design for the future built on fix, fixing up, recognising that issue would take us into a human rights place where we want to belong. Eliza, um, tremendous experience in particularly the rights of disabled. Give us a perspective on what you've seen in recent years, where it's at now, where the biggest challenges are and where the hope lies. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's an honour to be here. Uh, I guess I'm going to go, you know, based on my personal experience, and that is that I've been a person with disability all my life, and yet I hid it for so long. It's only been in the last couple of years that I've decided to speak out. For so long, when I went to a job interview, or I'm a musician, so I would go and meet prospective managers or record labels, I would sit on the chair and make sure that they were meeting me instead of me walking towards them. And I truly believe that that's because the way that we view people with disabilities. I'd been fed a lie that disability is negative and I believed it for so long and that really affected my whole life. Uh, last year, I decided to not only just accept myself but make change for people with disability. So I created the series um, as a, a scholarship recipient with the ABC around parenting with a disability. 
um, when I was pregnant with my daughter five years ago, I just noticed that um, there was absolutely nothing that represented someone with a physical disability or any disability. You get given so many books about parenting and there was nothing about disability. There was nothing on our TV. I couldn't even think of any film that represented a parent with disability. So I felt like it was time to make that change. And it, it was a grassroots series, and yet for some reason the timing was very right. And I had people that really responded to it. The general public responded to it. Other media organisations responded to it. Um, it was very surreal to suddenly be on the Today Show and, and, and <laughs> being there with a, a short-statured woman, Deborah Kenahan, and we're both sitting on the Today Show talking about parenting with a disability. And that was kind of the realisation that this is changing. People do want to see representation of people with disability. People do want to talk about this. And um, one of the parents who uh, is, is blind, she, when she went to her medical um, GP, was just discriminated against and told, basically, what are you doing? You, know, you shouldn't be having a child. Uh, and then recently, she's now having another child, and that very doctor said, I heard the series, I'm not going to say that. I've mm. learnt mm. from my mistakes. And so that made me realise that it is a grassroots thing. These are everyday people, and by hearing their voices on the radio, we get to understand who they are and realise that they're incredible parents. Uh, so I believe that there is a real change happening at a grassroots level, so that's exciting for me. Mm. Mm. So earlier this morning then we heard about a couple of areas which are severely challenged and continue to be. We, we've got um, Indigenous Australia and there's this in incredible challenge for Australia to move forward and we heard about refugees. You mentioned Hakeem and asylum seekers. It's a really, it's an area that Australia has struggled for a long time to move forward in. Um, we, we talked about language and at the start, uh, I think Professor Croucher was talking about having different conversations, having conversations as Australian in a respectful way. Um, how do we bring that to life? How do we change these discussions, Sam? I think any of us with any kind of convening power and any ability to cross over sectors, now we have to use those opportunities and those friendships and relationships to have these conversations in a very different way. I don't think we talk about convening as much as we talk about collaborating, but collaboration requires a group of people actually together um, at, from, from cross-sector, back, different backgrounds, but with a simple focus on a, on a simple truth. I think in this case, the protection of rights and the, I think the rights of communities and the rights of those of us that actually believe in values. And I think values is a great driver of convening. If I use an example that I'm really proud of uh, with an organisation I'm part of, the Centre for Policy Development, that's led by Travis McLeod, Travers and his team have this fundamental view that unless there is a group of people convened that represent business, um, civil society, the, the hard-working service delivering people in government um, and in business, if that doesn't happen, then it doesn't matter what policies we, we call for or what we ask for, there's no understanding about what actually happens in implementation. And as an example, CPD has been running something called the Cities and Settlement Program for a number of years, supported by the Meyer Foundation and the Vincent Fairfax Family Foundation, but importantly, the Boston Consulting Group and a group of, um, of employers like John Holland who meet in local communities and talk to local citizens about what would work look like for recently uh, arrived refugees and migrants. And I think Cathy will probably pick up on this in terms of what you're finding all around the country. But the CPD work shows that if you take a, um, a conversation that goes from rights and I guess a deficit to cities thriving and better settlement services and better jobs and better economies, and you bring everyone to that conversation, you actually get the grassroots response that says we want those refugees and migrant workers to actually be fully deployed in our communities. But it takes a convened group of interested parties who can put the money behind that, talk to, talk to uh, particularly to federal and state authorities and local government, and make those things happen and do on the ground uh, trials. So I think looking, we've got to look for new models. And I think cities and settlements with CPD, um, the, uh, the Council on the Economic Participation for Refugees that meets around the, 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 um, the region, led by Australian bureaucrats, and again, Australian think tanks, is trying to find a way to deal with forced migration sitting in our region of the kind that, that you got involved with, um, Craig, and saying we've got to find a better pathway for those people who are forced migrants 
that will look to Australia for, for, um, for our values and our, our support. Um, and there's great work being done, you just don't hear about it. But sitting around those tables again, uh, foreign affairs officials, um, bureau senior bureaucrats looking for solutions, business, um, civil society and think tanks. Um, we've just got to get that conversation more broadly animated and encourage anyone, as I said, who has any agency and any capacity to bring people to a conversation to do that because um, this is the time that I think we step up where our, our sort of more top-down federal uh, leaders have failed to see what community can really do once it is convened. Um, and there's, there's magic to be, to be had, I think. Mm. What about in terms of the diversity of uh, makeup of the Australian society? Uh, between religions particularly, but also all cultures, nationalities and backgrounds, can and should we be able to use human rights, universal values, Cathy, as, as we say here, the common ground to unite all of the, the different backgrounds and, and people of different faiths in Australia? What's your view? Right. So, oh, look, absolutely, yes. But I want to just tell you a little story, if I could, about this. Oh, there's a joke that goes around, how do you eat an elephant? Have you heard this? Mm -hmm. right. and, the, and the answer is, you know, in small bites. And this is a huge elephant that we're talking about. So when I was finished being a Member of Parliament in April, and the, one of the issues that irks me more than anything else is our offshore detention policy and what we're doing in Papua New Guinea with those male asylum seekers, because I, I used to work in PNG. So I thought, well, let's see if we can just eat this elephant one bite at a time. So I'm just gonna tell you a little story about human rights being um, that place where people come together. So with the, or under the auspice of, which is what you're saying, organisation, there's a group called Rural Australians for Refugees.org.au and they are rural, obviously, and in my electorate, northeast Victoria, there were nine groups of rural Australians for refugees, so they're active. And they, they're working in a whole lot of advocacy areas as well as resettlement, the Billa Wheeler family, that's all part of their work. So we've just done, we are doing a combined project at the moment, it's called hashtag T-O-N-Z, hashtag to New Zealand because we know New Zealand has made the offer to accept asylum seekers, mm -hmm. and we know we've got asylum seekers in PNG. Um, the PNG government has closed Manus. There's no longer people in Manus. They've all gone down to Port Moresby now in various mixtures there. The church groups in Papua New Guinea said, um, we, don't, we want this done, we want this sorted. They've put out a, a main statement to the Australian government, sort it. We, it's not part of the New, Zealand, New Guinea culture to have people in indefinite detention. Good on them. So we are now working across cultures, across religions, through Australians for rural Australians for refugees to mount a campaign to convince our Australian government to accept the very kind and generous offer of our neighbour country who can, has got the values and they live it, that our country hasn't got. So I've been travelling all around Australia as a guest of Rural Australians for Refugees, all the capital cities and many of the regions to build this movement. So I have been absolutely um, oh, that optimistic, uh, I don't know what the word is, so proud to come in and be part of every single faith group that comes to these meetings and says, yep, we reckon we could get to New Zealand, to NZ, because we want it, just the fact that two or three of our leaders don't want it is not enough to curtail the voice and the want of Australia, but in particular Papua New Guinea and New Zealand, our closest neighbours. Mm. So it does bring me a whole sense of human rights and a fair go, but it's exactly what you say, Sam, you need a structure, you can't just do it by yourself, so rural Australians for refugees, and you need a goal, like we've got a very small bit of the front <laughs> earlobe to convince the government to go to New Zealand, it doesn't solve all the problems of everything, but if we could get that done, that would be good because we know then it would have rollover effects to Nauru and we also know that it would take, we've got this problem with the uh, Medivac stuff that might or might not get through Parliament. But if everyone's off, New off Papua New Guinea, well, it takes, at least they'll get good treatment in New Zealand, we know that, which they're not getting in Papua New Guinea. So the optimism that I come here today and share with you that story, but if I could call you to task for it, if you could write to your both federal, both parties, 
because it's a, it's a shared policy of both those major parties. If you go to ruralaustralianforrefugees.org.au and they've got, but the, the, the letter writing campaign is what would it take to accept the New Zealand offer? So it doesn't, it doesn't tell, it doesn't demand, but it asks of our government, what would it take? And funnily enough, we're getting the pathetic answers of we're stopping the boats. Well, we know that, but that's not the question. The question, what would it take to you, our government to actually live the values of a fair go? And all those things that um, we heard about this morning about our international obligations. But we're living in a time when our government is out of sync and we know we could do better because we've got all the experience that you bought and we've got the Bill of Wheeler example. Like, I know that hasn't been resolved, but we actually were able to stop a, a serious injustice happening there. Here, here. So the um, one thing that I've seen in the last um, couple of years being involved with a range of organisations in the room and then through Hakeem and so on is that we do... There, there are incredible people in this room and organisations that you mentioned, one of them, who are doing phenomenal work in this field. But the reality is, if we just stay on that issue of asylum seekers for a moment, the reality is that this has been going on for a very long time. And despite all of this magnificent work going on and people putting so much time and emotional energy, it's extraordinary. And uh, Australia's in a position where we are going into another argument about whether we should actually help people get medical care when they're in need. Now, y you would struggle to, to uh, believe that that could actually be the case. Is that in part because of the language? Why? So if we're talking about common ground, then Australia having a better understanding and adherence to human rights, what, what is breaking down? Why is that not? If you, I, if you go to the vast majority of Australians and say, look, these people offshore, this is what we're doing to them. It's absolutely not okay. They would agree. Why has that been the case? And how can we change what has been an incredibly difficult discussion to have? I, look, I think we've just allowed the bifurcation of our values. I think we've, uh, we've not allowed ourselves to um, really dig deep into the traditional Australian values. We've allowed it to go off in a kind of warped way um, that our politicians tend to use to say they're talking to Australia, but in fact it's a language that's I don't hear, I don't think you, Cathy, hear it in our communities. Um, and it's made us distant from these issues. It's, made, it's actually kept human rights as a set of international norms. We've heard recently that we're now frightened of being part of international multilateral arrangements, of which we all used to be proud of because we were part of the creation of collaboration at the global level. Um, and yet our communities talk a different language. And I think, um, I wouldn't mind just dragging out the, the sport analogy because mm. you know, I've been working for a long, long time on climate change as well. And business you know, has now taken a strong advocacy on climate change, uh, joining scientists, but it's been a 20-year journey. And, and the language has been hard to, to get to ordinary citizens. But two weeks ago, Shane Warne mm -hmm. tweeted that he gets climate change because yeah. two and a half billion mm -hmm. cricket-loving kids in the subcontinent won't be able to play cricket because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the language shifts from these are scientists telling me doom and gloom to kids not being able to play sport and it being too hot to play sport. And all of a sudden, Shane Warne says, I'm a climate scientist. And I think there's a lesson in that, as there was for you uh, with sport and human rights, that we've got to actually make these, uh, these big, big issues normalised for normal citizens, mm. and we've got to find the impact that, pe that affects people and, and go with that and not stay distant from it and not let our governments tell us that it's not relevant. So I'm a kind of newfound Shane Warne fan mm. because he's got <laughs> millions of followers <laughs> who now think it's okay to talk about climate change. Well, that's great. And I think it's great. And I think, you know, um, but, but, but it's on us, though. We've got to mm. actually encourage the language of values and heart mm. and investing in communities because something is going on in our world that's completely broken mm. from the, the way in which the language is being used to, to keep us mm. at bay, I fear. Vanessa. So when I was... a independent member of parliament, and I acknowledge, Rod, uh, Mr. Tip, Mr. Tipton, you're here as well, you know this circumstance. But I sat opposite the Prime Minister of Australia and said, what would it take? And he said, well, Cathy, you've got the vote in parliament, which was last year, around Medivac. And I said, well, I'm prepared to talk to you about this. And in the end, he didn't come to the table. The Prime Minister of Australia was prepared to lose a vote on the floor of Parliament rather than solve this particular problem. 
So what happened was we had Karen Phelps who put up that Medivac legislation and the, oppo the opposition and the independents all voted in support and we won that vote. Um, Bob Catter from Queensland didn't vote with us. But the vote went through then and went through the Senate and became law. So what is it you're talking about? That a Prime Minister of a country would agree to lose a vote on the floor of Parliament rather than, oh, it makes me want to cry, stand up to his professed values of loving your neighbour as yourself, do good to those, you know, and when you die and you go to heaven and God said, you know, <laughs> did you love your neighbour as yourself? And every morning in Parliament we would stand up and we would say the Our Father together. And we profess these Christian values. And yet the Prime Minister of Australia and the Liberal Party and the National Party voted not to bring sick people out of that country. So what does it take? I don't know the answer. But I know in my electorate of Indi, that was the number one pressing issue. So I went to Scott and said, look, mate, I will vote with you if you give me something my community would agree for. I will do that. And I sat opposite him two or three times over summer this year and had that discussion. But I said, you've got to give me something that my community is going to accept because that's what I'm about. You know, in the end he said no. And why I think he said no, because he had an election coming up and at that time before we had the atrocity in New Zealand, he was thinking of running a Tampa-style election. That's what I think happened. So that's base politics. So what does it take to change that? Truly, I don't know the answer, because if I did, I would be doing it. But I suppose that's why I'm sharing with you today about this Rural Australians for Refugees. That if every single one of your organisations could get in contact with your state, with your federal member and your, your 12 senators, and say, guys, what would it take to accept New Zealand? Because we want New Zealand, if you can't do it here, if you haven't got the grace, the compassion and the mercy, New Zealand's got it, and let's go there. Thank you, Cathy. Eliza, um, give us a, a perspective, please. We heard a little bit about business and sport, and we'll return to those in a moment. What about art, theatre, film? How important are they to both inclusion, uh, opportunities to work, uh, and also changing mindsets? Very important, I think. I think there's still a mindset that art is a hobby <laughs> for many. And in fact, it's, um, it's so important. It's actually vital to change the attitudes and barriers that people with disabilities face. Um, the way that I've seen that played out personally, I'm actually so many ways, but um, first way is that I'm part of a theatre company for people with disability in Bendigo. Um, as I said previously, I'm a musician, so I write the music for their work. And each member of that cast has an intellectual disability. Each member of that cast writes every single show and is part of the music making. So we did a show that was about disability, but also funnily enough about the forest. And we went out into the forest as a collective and collected all different sounds out in the forest all together and then turned them into a soundscape. And not only did that empower each person with disability, but it also enabled them to speak up about what's important to them. So I think that arts is a way that it, it is like, a, it's, a, it's enabling voice and it's enabling change. Another thing is um, authentic casting and representation on TV and our screens. For so long, people with disability have been cast by people without a disability. And I actually think that we'll look back on this and this will be similar to blackface because this is employment for people with disability. If, people, if we have a wheelchair user and she's an actor and she's an incredible actor to just say as a, as a case example, and she can't even get that role that's being cast for a wheelchair mm -hmm. user, what role is she going to get? What employment is she going to get? And then not only that, is how are we seeing ourselves on the screen then? If we're, we're seeing non-disabled people play disabled people. And you, know, you look at all the award ceremonies and so many of them are from non-disabled people playing disabled people. Mm. Um, 
it's it's incredible. It's, it's you know these are the things that have to change because we need to see more representation of people with disabilities. And then not only that, we recently saw somebody win, I think it was the Tony Award, and she she is a person with disability, and that was absolutely fantastic. But she couldn't get up on the stage, mm. <laughs> so she had to come from the back of the stage. And that's like why that <laughs> you know you can't you can't even get up on the stage. So that's a barrier. So these are the things that need to change. And I really believe that art is a fantastic, incredible way that we can really see the difference. We see ourselves on the screens. We feel we can through that. Mm. So is, if we heard about the next generation, the younger generation from uh, the High Commissioner before and Greta and others, what role does human rights education in schools play in Australia going forward? Sorry, was that for me? Yeah, anyway. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise. Um, so can you repeat that question? Uh, so if we talked about the next generation here and, of course, around the climate, everyone you know, has, has heard their voices loud and clear in recent times. But in order to change some of these mindsets, is it worthwhile and how important would it be to speak to school children about their rights and about general human rights so that there's a better understanding of the next generation? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that that's where it's got to begin. Um, I, for one, am often in communication with different schools around, especially around regional Victoria. I'm, I live in Castlemaine and based in Bendigo for a lot of my work. And it's still very similar in that we're not seeing even teachers represented with disability. We're not seeing anybody come in and talk to students about disability. So again, it's lack of representation. Uh, but there is an initiative that's just come out through the ABC that I'm part of, uh, through ABC Me, that's uh, enabled people with disability to write stories about young people with disability and it's going to be shown um, on International Day of People with Disability in December. And so that TV show I wrote and produced and it's about a boy, um, it's a live action drama but it's about a boy that's short statured and it's about the social model of disability. And that is that the, you know, the physical world around us is the things that disables us, the attitudes uh, are the things that disable us. So um, the first day he lives, it's, it's just an everyday day, but everything's not working. He keeps saying to his dad, is this a dream? He goes to school, is this a dream? He can't reach his locker. He can't open the gate at the, do at the front of the school. He can't get down the stairs very well. All of these, he can't get out of bed. All of these things that, as a, as a child, you'd be saying, but that's mm. how we all live. That's, that's, that's you know, normal. And then the next day, he actually plays a video game and he builds an accessible world in this video game. And the next day when he wakes up, all of those things suddenly change. Mm. And so all the lockers in the school move to everybody's height. The gate, when he walks, it opens up. All the things that actually are very possible. Um, and I, I'm really excited to show children that there's nothing to change about this boy. We don't want to change him. He's fantastic. He's incredible, he's talented. Uh, the things that we need to change is the world. The things that we need to change are attitudes and the physical barriers that people with disabilities face. So is <laughs> that the... <laughs> <laughs> I think... Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I think Eliza's answered your question better. I, I don't think we have any hope really of changing the school system. We've been trying. Mm. I think anyone who cares about, as you heard in the earlier panel, about Indigenous languages or mm. truth-telling about our history, it's an enormous challenge. So I, I just think that we've got to pay real respect to the great teachers who actually mm. do, the, do the heavy lifting of being what kids need to see and mm. sort of actually doing more of the work, having your play, having your books mm. read, um, going to those shows, going to back-to-back -to -back theatre, yeah. you know, just around the corner from you in in uh, Geelong and, and learning to actually think about where the labels have really been put um, mm. by us as opposed to, to what we learn. Um, and if we, we haven't been able to get ethics training into the schools as a kind of norm yet, and that's been resisted mm. as, a, as a basic right for kids. Um, so I think it's, 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 a, it's mm. we've, just got to, we've got to really back our teachers into showing what's possible against the backdrop of, um, you know, I think teachers who've actually been great for trans kids. Mm. You know, who've actually shown what it means to belong in a school when you're struggling with your sexuality and your choices. You know, we've got to back those teachers in and those people who, and families and communities because that's showing kids what their rights are 
I'm not sure they'll change the education system, mm. sadly. <laughs> and I, I've just got a quick example. Again, northeast Victoria, Bright. Some of you will know Bright up in the mountains. They teach, um, at P12 school, they teach the local language there, Deuteroa, to P12, right through. Mm. And the kids at that school are now teaching the kids at Little Indi uh, Wurundjeri Primary School, uh, Deuteroa. And this coming Sunday afternoon, we're having a community storytelling session where the local Indigenous elder, uh, Mr Murray, is going to tell his story to the community of the language. So I just love the, the change that's taking place. So we've got high school kids talking their language at Year 12. They've, they're teaching the local little kids about how to do it and then the, the community's been invited in in storytelling. So the movement for change is there and people have got ownership of it, but it's in, it needs the organisational structure to, to build that out. A bit like what the, um, the ABC did with uh, school for four, well, old people's homes oh, for four-year-olds, four yeah. and what an impact that has made. Yeah. So perhaps a, a similar program on how our communities can, yeah. using media, the arts and the media and our TV, yeah. to actually take those models and, and show that it can be done, yeah. and that it creates community and it brings knowledge of human rights with it because. As, as um, again, the Aboriginal um, panel said this morning, we didn't, we weren't taught it, we didn't know it, but now our community definitely knows it, and it's just got enormous pride in the stories that our kids are telling us about language. So the social institutions are very important. Then two of the large ones, of course, are the business, business council, the the, the commerce, and of course sport. Before we move to the final questions, can I just ask you, Sam, around sport particularly? Should it do more? You know about the movement in recent years to human rights policies in sport, including FIFA, which was very important, inc incredibly important in Hakim's case and him, in his campaign. Uh, there's been some challenges recently. We've had on one side uh, the great Adam Goods. We've had also Israel Folau. And just in the last 24 hours, we had a really interesting case in the NBA, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, where I think the general manager of one of their clubs spoke out in, in, in support of the uh, democratic uh, strikes and protests in Hong Kong. Yeah. And there's been really severe reaction from China from where the NBA has huge commercial support. Uh, so what's your view, should sport do more? And are uh, sporting, um, Dylan Olcott, Kurt Fernley, incredibly vocal, passionate and effective. Are they important? Do we need raw, more role models in that regard? Yes, yes and yes. Okay. I think, um, I think um, th what you showed with um, Sadin Hakim was indicative, and I guess um, was a motif of what else has to happen in sport. Um, I pay respect to Moya Dodd, who's in the audience. Moya was the first woman on the FIFA, if she is, on the FIFA board. Um, gender in sports, rights in sports, racism in sport. Um, as you said at the very beginning, it, it touches the heart of a lot of the Australian psyche. It doesn't mean we all have to be sports nuts, but it is a very important driver of change. And there needs to be a lot more done. We're about to see a fight over women's rights in the AFL about the way in which players' yes. associations aren't built for newcomers to their sport in the form of women, and they're standing up. And I think the more we, we can encourage those organisations to think about this through a rights lens, the better. The problem is sport is not built to actually do this terribly well. So it doesn't have a lot of the, um, it doesn't have enough Craig Fosters and Moya Dodds, but it, it, has to, it has to move in that direction. Um, just on business though, I think what is important to note, and there's people here representing these organisations today, business only got to do this when there was really strong advocacy and, the co um, and coalitions of interest. Um, organisations like the Global Compact Network Australia, which g gave a, a forum for business to come together to understand human rights and talk about that in a business sense. Um, the Business and Human Rights Forums that they are running, the, um, the Global Business Commission for Sustainable Development, which was chaired by a global CEO, Paul Polman. He was the former uh, global CEO of Unilever, and now he just advocates for rights around the world um, uh, coming out of a business tradition. But again, it was very well supported by the, the system mm. change required to get there. So sport will need a lot of support in the systemic changes, but mm. it's a great place to talk about rights. Indeed, I agree. Wholeheartedly. Okay, shall we move to a, a couple of final questions? Thank you for everyone for your contribution. Uh, anyone can answer this. Uh, are capitalism and human rights inherently at odds with each other? Can profits and humanity coexist? <laughs> I'll have a go. I, I, I think yes, you're welcome. The, I think mm. it's the way you describe capitalism. I think capitalism is going through a complete revision at the moment. The great economist Mariana Mazzucato 
talked about this a lot, that we are seeing the reformation of capitalism and it's called inclusive capitalism. And it means that there's not a primacy of shareholders, that it is around the breadth of stakeholders that must benefit from the, the behavior and the profit that is generated by companies. When you see um, very big investors controlling trillions of US dollars, telling boards and chief executives that rights, climate change, gender equality, are now part of how they'll measure the company's ability to actually be invested in, something is changing in the capitalist model. And the Bank of England governor has told us only the last couple of weeks that, that climate change and failure to do with climate change will be the biggest disruptor to the global finance system, which means capitalism will be the great loser in that. So if we don't act properly, um, the capitalist system can't work. So I'm up for kind of a, a strategic optimism around inclusive capitalism dealt with very, very well that actually brings in all stakeholders. Wonderful. And finally, uh, to anyone, are quotas the best way to address inequalities in representation or are there other alternatives to promoting social inclusion and diversity? Mm, I just, I feel like quotas are a bit tokenistic at times. So, um, but then again, you know, I feel like if they're going to create jobs and opportunities for people with disability, then look, if, that, if that's the way it has to happen, that's the way it has to happen. So, yeah, I feel like they are a starting point. Um, you know, 2.1 million Australians um, are of working age with disability and yet only half of those are employed. So, you know, they're the statistics. So if we do need to create a quota where we say 20% of the population have a disability, in all of our companies we need to have 20% or, you know, at or a little bit less, if, if that's the way it has to go, of people with disability in our company, then those quotas are going to create jobs. Quotas so are the only yeah, way we get things done. Yeah. Uh, I still realise that the fact that um, people without disabilities can still play someone with a disability needs a yeah. quota that says in our film and television industry, the quota is that people with disabilities will play those roles. The quota system has worked for women. Mm. Um, people who are against quotas forget that there's been a quota working against us whether it's women or any form of, of, of lack of privilege forever. And it's about always hiring in your own likeness and, and, and not actually looking for the broadest um, mm. potential in people. So I think quotas actually are the first step to actually getting to inclusion. Um, and, and, and if you don't do it, hoping, wishing and praying doesn't change the world for those that have been left out. Mm. So. Yeah, that, I agree with that. Thank you very much. Well, we had a quota, ladies and gentlemen, of just three this morning. I'm sure you'll agree with me that they were quite magnificent. Please put your hands together for our three fabulous panelists. You too.